If you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe to the channel, and also don't forget to click on the notification bell, so you'll be up to date on all videos released from the Everything Network. Born in Brooklyn on January 19, 1921, little is known about Billy Bat's early life, other than that he grew up in the same area as De Simone and Hill. In 1959, Bats became an associate with the Gambino crime family, and in 1961 became a full member, but was not a made man. He was a protege street soldier for Carmine Fatico. In May 1958, Bats became a member of what would become known as the Ormento Group, a heroin smuggling ring, named after John Ormento, a captain in the Lucchese crime family, the CEO of the group. Managing directors were Carmine Galante and Anthony Mira. On February 14, 1959, he went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, to complete a drug deal for Joseph, Joe the Crow del Vecchio, and Oreste, Ernie Boy, Abamonte. When he arrived in Bridgeport, undercover police arrested Bats and charged him with possession and exchange of narcotics. He was later convicted of heroin smuggling in June 1962, alongside co-defendant Galante, and sentenced to 15 years in the Federal Correctional Institution in Danbury, Connecticut. The Goodfellas was an infamous crew of the Lucchese crime family, under the leadership of Paul Vario, that included members such as Jimmy Burke, Henry Hill, and Thomas D. Simone. Thomas D. Simone, also known as Two Gun Tommy, was an Italian-American mobster associate of the Lucchese crime family. He was a grandson and nephew of Los Angeles crime family bosses Rosario and Frank D. Simone, respectively. He was married to a woman named Angelica, nicknamed Cookie, but also had many mistresses, including famous 1970s supermodel Teresa Ferrar. In the 1990s film Goodfellas, the character Tommy DeVito, played by Joe Pesci, is mostly based on D. Simone. Tommy had a reputation for brutality, cruelty and violence, he was known as a vicious killer and was widely feared for his use of extreme violence and also known for killing people for the smallest reasons. He was regarded as a psychopath who enjoyed what he did. Henry Hill stated that Tommy was a homicidal maniac and a cold-blooded killing machine. Henry also said Tommy enjoyed it like a hobby. It was his favorite thing to do, and he scared lots of guys, he scared the scary guys. Hill also stated that he seen him kill over 10 people. Every time he'd kill somebody, he would put a notch on his pistol or his shotgun, Hill said he once counted over 20 notches on Tommy's pistol, that's how vicious, wild and crazy Tommy was. He knew how to kill and he was good at it. Henry Hill grew up in Brooklyn, New York. His father, Henry Hill Sr., was an Irish-American electrician, and his mother, Carmela Hill, was a Sicilian-American. Henry and his seven siblings lived together in a small house in East Brooklyn. From an early age he admired the local mobsters that socialized across the street from his home, who included Paul Vario, a captain in the Lucchese crime family. In his early teens Hill began running errands at Vario's cab stand, shoe shine stand, and pizza shop. Paul Vario was a powerful and longtime captain in the Lucchese crime family. He served as the underboss and consigliere in the early 1970s, but felt it was too much responsibility, and a couple years later was able to resign under Lucchese boss Carmine Tremonti's approval. Paulie was a maternal cousin of Colombo crime family consigliere Johnny Otto and his brother, mobster Stevie Otto. Vario ran a very large crew of sophisticated thieves, criminal masterminds and ruthless killers. Additionally he was thought to have held the position of acting underboss of the Lucchese crime family, just prior to the conviction of then-mob boss Carmine Tremonti, and before Anthony Corallo became the official leader. Under the rule of Corallo, the underboss rank went to Salvador Santoro. For over 30 years, Pauli was one of the richest and most powerful gangsters in America. The Vario crew stole from the neighboring JFK International Airport through hijacking, Prior to 1963, the airport was known as the Idle Wild Airport and was also then used as fountain for stealing. Besides the Vario crew, a well-known Gambino crew, led by Carmine Fatico and later John Gotti, also exploited the airport for their own criminal gain. According to former Vario associate Henry Hill, the airport was like the crew's personal bank. Because of his influence over the cargo haulers union, Holly could often threaten with a labor strike in order to turn an investigation away. During the 1980s, the FBI would listen in with hidden microphones as fellow Lucchese family members and associates boasted, we own JFK, an obvious testament to the tremendous power and influence Vario wielded. 
illegal gambling, extortion, numbers racket, labor racketeering, prostitution, pornography, bookmaking, and loan sharking were also staples for Polly's crew and associates. It was believed that any form of gambling, most commonly the numbers game, bookmaking or underground casinos, that operated in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn was run by Avario. Criminals, pimps, drug dealers, bookmakers, or loan sharks, wishing to operate in Vario's area, had to pay him and his brothers a huge portion of their earnings, at least 30%. He and his brothers owned and ran many legal businesses, including labor unions, real estate, clothing suit and tuxedo stores, horse race tracks, churches, movie theaters, junk and scrap yards, flower shops, Italian restaurants, pizza shops, nightclubs, laundromats and dry cleaners, hotels, bars and bakeries, barber auto and ice cream shops, liquor and convenience stores, also gas stations, taxi services, car dealerships, carpentry, electrical, engineering, plumbing companies, and trucking companies, he also had a hand in the construction companies, waste management companies, fish markets, meat markets, weapon shops, and cab stands all over New York and across the United States, from which he would conduct business most of the time. His brother Vito ran the Euclid Avenue Cab Company and Presto's Pizza Shop. At his height, Paulie was earning over $30 million a year. He was raking in an enormous amount of cash for the Lucchese crime family, which earned him major respect and admiration from the commission. Vario and his brothers, along with their criminal associates, operated in Brownsville. Both of his most popular cab stands and pizza shops were located in close proximity and were popular hangouts for the crew. In the early 1970s, Vario became a multimillionaire and was considered one of the richest and most powerful people in America until his conviction. According to Henry Hill, According to Henry Hill, Vario was an extremely powerful man who controlled dozens of labor unions in New York and had a lot of prominent politicians in his pocket all over the country. Pauly was extremely intelligent, sophisticated, perceptive, intuitive, and astute. He was always very careful, low-key and secretive. He never used a phone because he always believed it was too easy for law enforcement to hear his conversations. He never would speak of anything illegal to anyone, not even his trusted associates or his brothers, and he would always check every one of his companies and businesses for FBI electronic devices. Vario always made it a huge priority to limit his exposure to potentially detrimental conversations and discussions, such as wiretaps, bugs and electronic devices. Pauly would always turn up his radio very loud to neutralize FBI wiretaps, he would even use hand gestures, write it down on a piece of paper, or just nod his head yes or no. Whenever an associate would bring up something illegal to Vario, he would not verbally respond, sometimes depending on the associate he wouldn't even acknowledge them. He was a very intelligent, perceptive, and sophisticated mobster and never let his guard down for any reason. Vario was also fiercely loyal to the mob and totally believed in the oath of the mafia. His soldiers and underlings were completely loyal to him, they were as loyal as loyal gets, they wouldn't betray him for nothing or anyone, they would kill for him in a heartbeat. In the early 1970s, Pauly was a membership director for mob boss Joseph Colombo's Italian-American Civil Rights League. However, he rescinded his membership and withdrew all support when it became apparent that the relentless accusations Colombo was making against the FBI and U.S. government about racism and anti-Italian discrimination were attracting attention. Paul Vario was a married man with three sons, all of whom became involved in their father's dealings in one Tommy was introduced to the Vario crew in 1965. Henry Hill said in Wise Guy, Jimmy Burke came by the cab stand one day with a skinny kid who was wearing a Wise Guy suit and had a pencil mustache. That guy was Tommy D. Simone. He was one of those kids who looked younger than he was just because he was trying to look older. Jimmy had been a friend of Tommy's family for years and wanted Henry to watch out for Tommy and teach him the cigarette business. Jimmy the gent was an Irish gangster, hitman, and associate of the Lucchese crime family. Burke was a well-respected associate and is most famous for masterminding the Lafonza heist in 1978, which was at the time the largest robbery in American history. An estimated $6 million in cash and $2.8 million in jewels were stolen. Investigators later determined the crime was planned and organized by Jimmy the Gent. Jimmy is the father of small-time mobster and Lafonza heist suspect Frankie Burke, Jesse James Burke, and Catherine Burke. Catherine Burke was the woman who married Bonanno crime family member Anthony Indelicato in 1992. Jimmy Conway, a character in the movie Goodfellas played by Robert De Niro, is based on Jimmy Burke. For over two decades, Jimmy was the wealthiest and most powerful Irish gangster in America. He is considered by the FBI to be the most powerful and most dangerous Irish gangster of all time. By 1977, he was already a multi-millionaire. His extraordinary wealth and power continued to grow to the point where he became one of the richest and most powerful gangsters in America. 
Even though there were a lot of Italian mobsters that were wealthier and far more powerful than Jimmy, he became the first non-Italian that earned the respect of a made man in the American Mafia. The five families of New York respected him. They looked at Jimmy as an equal. He has also been highly respected by law enforcement for being a criminal genius and for his ingenious abilities to make enormous amounts of money in such small periods of time. He has even been incredibly respected as a legend by Italian mobsters and even by mafia bosses all over the country. He has been described by mobsters all over New York as a true gangster. As a teenager, Burke got in trouble with the law and spent a considerable time in jail. In 1949, at age 18, he was sentenced to five years in prison for forgery as he passed counterfeit checks for mobster Dominic Sersani. Behind bars, he mixed with a number of mafia members and other criminals of all nationalities in New York. Jimmy stood 6'5 and weighed over 270 pounds. He petrified men due to his intimidating size and fearsome reputation as a mafia enforcer. He had an evil, ice-cold stare. If there was just the littlest amount of trouble, he'd be all over you in a second. He'd grab a guy's tie and slam his face into the table before the guy knew he was in a war. He'd go to war with anybody, no matter who they were or who they were with. Jimmy Burke was absolutely fearless and wasn't scared of anybody. He could be the nicest guy in the world or your worst nightmare. It is alleged that he committed a number of murders, but no victims were ever named. Burke is rumored to have murdered and dismembered an ex-boyfriend of his bride because he was being a nuisance. Jimmy was the mentor of Thomas D. Simone, Henry Hill and Angelo Seppi, who were all young men in the 1960s and carried out jobs such as selling stolen merchandise for Burke. They eventually became part of his crew and worked out of South Ozone Park, Queens, they also set up shop in East Brooklyn. The crew helped Burke with the hijacking of delivery trucks, armed robbery, burglary, drug and weapons trafficking, cigarette smuggling, auto theft, loan sharking, protection rackets, bookmaking, the dealing and fencing of stolen property, extortion, fraud, and contract killing. According to Hill, Burke would usually give $50 to the drivers of the trucks they stole, as if he were tipping them for their inconvenience. This led to his nickname Jimmy the Gent. He owned a bar in South Queens called Robert's Lounge. It was a favorite hangout of Jimmy and his crew and other mob associates. He ran a loan shark and bookmaking operation that was based at the bar and high-stakes poker games in the basement of which he would receive a cut of the earnings. Jimmy also owned a dress factory, also in South Ozone Park, Queens, which kept him awash in laundered money. While not a mafia member, Burke had one important mob member as a friend and associate, Captain Paul Vario. In 1960, Henry joined the Army and was stationed at Fort Bragg, near Fayetteville, North Carolina. For three years, he was a member of the 82nd Airborne Paratrooper Unit. However, he maintained contact with Vario and his other friends in New York throughout his enlistment. Henry continued to hustle while in the service, selling extra food, loan sharking salary advances to his fellow soldiers, and selling tax-free cigarettes. Before being discharged, he spent two months in a military stockade for fighting and stealing a sheriff's car for a joyride. In 1963, he returned to New York, beginning the most notorious phase of his criminal career. Henry, along with Jimmy and Tommy, plus others who were in Jimmy's crew, carried out the Air France robbery in 1967 and the huge Lafonza heist in 1978. They also were the cause of numerous mob-related murders during that time. In 1965, Henry met his wife, Karen. The two first eloped to North Carolina, where they had a large wedding, to which most of Hell's gangster friends were invited. After the birth of their two children, they rented an apartment in a two-family home in Island Park, New York in 1969. Karen was said to be very close to the mob life. When she was asked about such mobsters as Tommy D. Simone, she said that he was infamous for his violent temper. Tommy's sister was quoted as saying her brother's teenage years revolved around boxing, lifting weights, smoking cigarettes, and beating the mess out of a punching bag he kept in a spare room. He had a short fuse and an animalistic appetite. He would drink almost a gallon of whole milk a day. His only other childhood hobby was collecting different kinds of pocket knives that he kept in an old cigar box under his bed. While playing pinnacle with Joseph Ionuzzi and Tommy Agro, he would throw darts at the other players when he started losing. During the 1960s, Tommy and fellow associates Henry Hill, Joey Allegro, and Stanley Diamond would go on regular hijackings. While hijacking, Tommy would always carry his gun in a brown paper bag. Walking down the street, he looked like he was bringing you a sandwich instead of a 38 Henry said. Tommy committed what is believed to have been his first murder on March 15, 1968, at the age of 18. He was walking down the street with Henry when Tommy spotted Howard Goldstein, a passing pedestrian, a random stranger unknown to either of them. Henry recalls Tommy turning to him and saying, hey Henry, watch this. Tommy yelled, hey cocksucker. Pulled out a pistol, shot and killed Goldstein. 
In 1970, Henry Hill said they threw a welcome home party at Robert's Lounge for Billy Batts, who was a mobster with the Gambino crime family and also a longtime friend of John Gotti. Batts had just been released from prison after serving a six-year term for drug possession. Henry states in Wise Guy that Billy saw Tommy and asked him if he still shined shoes and Tommy took this as an insult. He also said that Billy Batts provoked Tommy because he wanted to impress some mobsters from another crime family. A couple of minutes later when the issue died down, Tommy leaned over to Henry Hill and Jimmy Burke and said, I'm gonna kill that man. Henry saw in Tommy's eyes that he was serious about it. A couple of weeks later, on June 11, 1970, Billy Batts went over to the suite owned by Henry in Jamaica, Queens, to go drinking with Tommy's crew, which including Henry, Tommy, and Jimmy. Later that night Tommy took his girlfriend home and Jimmy started making Batts feel comfortable. Twenty minutes later, Tommy arrived with a 38 revolver and a plastic mattress cover. Tommy walked over to him at the corner of the bar and viciously started attacking Billy Batts. Before he was attacked, Jimmy tightened his arms around Billy and he was pistol whipped with a 38 revolver. Batts was so inebriated from heavy drinking, he failed to make any effort to defend himself. The real reason for the murder was said to be that Jimmy had taken over Billy Batts' loan sharking business while he was in prison. According to Henry, Billy Batts had been complaining to Joe Gallo about getting back this racket. Not wanting to return the business to Billy, Jimmy decided to eliminate him instead. After Batts was attacked and presumably killed, the three placed his body in the trunk of Henry's car and drove away from the bar. While they were driving, the car had a minor collision with a van on the Van Wyck Expressway in Queens. Soon after the collision, the men started hearing thudding sounds from the trunk and realized that Batts was still alive. They then stopped at Tommy's mother's house to collect a knife, some lye, and a shovel. She made them coffee, they chit-chatted and had some breakfast while Billy Batts was still in the trunk. Upon arriving at an isolated piece of land in Connecticut, owned by a friend of Jimmy's, the three mobsters opened the trunk of the car and finished Batts off. Once he died, the men buried him under a dog kennel. Hill said that Jimmy and Tommy didn't actually shoot him, they just stabbed him 30 or 40 times. Six months after the murder, Jimmy found out that his friend sold the Connecticut property in order for homes to be built. Jimmy ordered Henry and Tommy to exhume his body and dispose of him elsewhere. In Wise Guy, Hill said the body was eventually put in a mechanical compactor at a New Jersey junkyard. At the time of the murder, Billy Batts was 49 years old and was a respected and feared made man in the Gambino crime family. Murdering a made man without the official consent of his family's leadership was an unforgivable offense in the mafia code of a murder, especially by a rival family and a mere associate such as Tommy. DeSimone's third known murder was a young man named Spider, who was serving as a bartender at a card game where he and Tommy had an argument when he forgot to bring Tommy his drink. This resulted in Tommy pulling out a handgun and demanding that Spider start dancing to dodge the bullets. Tommy shot him in the foot when he refused. A week later, when Spider was again serving drinks, now in a full leg cast, Tommy started to tease him about his wounded foot. Spider replied, why don't you go F yourself, Tommy? After a stunned silence, a delighted and impressed Jimmy, having now developed a respect for the kid for sticking up for himself. Jimmy gave Spider some money before jokingly teasing Tommy, who hadn't said or done anything in retaliation, about going soft. Tommy, in his usual way, took the teasing seriously and lost his temper, fatally shooting Spider three times in the chest, angrily demanding of Jimmy if that was good enough for him. Jimmy and Henry were furious with Tommy's lack of control. Jimmy yelled, all right, you dumb uck, since you're going to be a big FN wise guy, you dig the hole. Jimmy made Tommy bury Spider's body in the cellar by himself. Hill stated that, after he saw this, he was truly convinced that Tommy was a total psychopath. It is believed that Spider's body was subsequently moved because it was not found in the location later gave to authorities. There is also recent speculation as to whether Spider even existed, as the police never found a birth certificate, family or even friends, indicating that Hill possibly made the story up, or the most popular when talked about, that he was a worker here illegal. His fourth murder, according to Hill, occurred when Tommy and another associate named Stanley Diamond got carried away after being asked to rough up a witness to a robbery. After a truck heist, a foreman had refused to allow Jimmy to unload the cargo of a hijacked truck in his warehouse and vehemently protested because they had no union cards. Jimmy attempted to reason with the man who stood his ground and refused to be intimidated. He later sent Tommy and Stanley Diamond to the man's house in the boondocks of New Jersey with instructions to threaten and rough up the man to ensure he would cooperate with Burke in the future. Tommy and Stanley Diamond, angry and so worked up about having to drive all the way to New Jersey, ended up beating the man to death.
Tommy's fifth known murder occurred when Jimmy ordered the murder of his best friend, Dominic Remo Sersani, who became an informant. He was going to set Jimmy up in a cigarette hijack for Burke to get arrested. Jimmy got suspicious about Sersani and later found out from one of his friends in the DA's office that Sersani was talking to the NYPD and that they were going to arrest Jimmy on a truck hijacking charge. Tommy and Jimmy killed Remo that same week. The pair met him at Robert's lounge and said to him let's take a ride. Tommy strangled him with piano wire. Henry Hill said the guy put up some fight. He kicked and swung like crazy before he died. Jimmy had his body buried behind Robert's lounge. Tommy also killed Gotti protege Ronald Jared on December 18, 1974. Tommy had dated Ronald's sister and had beaten her up, prompting Ronald to threaten to kill him. When Tommy heard about the threat, he went to the brother's apartment and knocked on the door. He opened the door and punched him in the face. DeSimone then shot him between the eyes. DeSimone would strike again by killing Parnell Edwards. Tommy was a good friend of Edwards but was disappointed to when he failed to get rid of the truck used in the LaFonza heist where the evidence should have been destroyed. When Tommy was told by a high-ranking maid member that he could become a maid man if he carried out this hit, Tommy agreed. Once he found out where Edwards was hiding, he visited him and shot him six times in the chest and head with a silencer pistol. With the murders adding up, the heat on the Goodfellas started to rise. Already Already back in 1970 Paulie began to come under greater scrutiny from the FBI for being connected to the crew, amongst other things. Since the late 1960s the Vario brothers had ventured into the junkyard business, most likely a front for a chop shop operation, and would use an on-site trailer as an office to discuss business legal and illegal. As a result of FBI surveillance, Vario was indicted but refused to cooperate. He was eventually found guilty of contempt and conspiracy to commit perjury and was sentenced to three years. Prior to his conviction it was thought that Vario was serving as the underboss to then-boss Carmine Tremonti. Vario was shipped off to the federal prison located in Lewisburg. While in prison, he was part of the infamous Mafia Row. This was a tier of fellow mobsters, according to Hill, who lived like kings behind bars. In 1972, Jimmy Burke and Henry Hill were arrested for beating up Gaspar Siaccio in Tampa, Florida. Gaspar owed a large gambling debt to their friend the union boss Casey Rosado. They were charged with extortion and convicted and sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. Jimmy was paroled after six years and went straight back into the life of crime, as did Hill, who got out around the same time. Henry Hill shortly began trafficking in drugs, Burke was also soon involved in this new enterprise, even though the Lucchese crime family, with whom they were associated, did not authorize any of its members to deal in drugs. This Lucchese ban was made because the prison sentences imposed on anyone convicted of drug trafficking were so lengthy that the accused would often become informants in exchange for a lighter sentence. This is exactly what Henry Hill would eventually do. It is claimed by some that he was involved in at least 20 murders during his career. Holly knew about Hill's drug dealing in prison and warned him not to continue with this now that he was out. During the first few years of his release, Vario maintained his strong ties to the notorious Lucchese family captain and major drug trafficker Joseph D. Palmero. Because of their surveillance, the FBI believed that Pauli had financed at least one large-scale cocaine shipment with the assistance of D. Palermo. The shipment was seized in Queens following a tip to the DEA and was valued at $2 million. Vario's misfortune was soon forgotten when he approved of the Lafonza heist in 1978 and collected a great tribute payment of over $2 million. Hill nevertheless started a drug trafficking operation with Paul Mazzi whom Hill had contacted while in prison, earning up to $4,000 per week. The potential for Henry to earn large amounts of money was too great to resist. He began wholesaling marijuana, cocaine, and heroin, and was earning an enormous amount of money. After the murders of several of his friends by Jimmy Burke, following the LaFonza heist, and the disappearance of his close friend Tommy D. Simone, who, Henry believed, had been delivered by Polly into the hands of the Gambino crime family for killing two maid members without permission. Tommy's wife, Angela, reported him missing. She said she had last seen Tommy a few weeks earlier when he borrowed $60 from her. Following the LaFonza heist, six people who had been involved had all been murdered on the orders of Jimmy, who wanted to avoid paying them their share of the loot. For years, the New York Police Department and the FBI believed that Tommy had either been murdered by Burke or that he was in hiding to avoid being killed. D. Simone's brother-in-law, Lucchese family member Joseph the Barber Spiney, also disappeared shortly afterward. When Hill became an FBI informant in 1980, he told authorities that Tommy had been murdered by the Gambino crime family. Despite the oft-given date of death being of January 14, 1979, the exact date of Tommy's murder is uncertain. Henry claimed that in the week after Christmas, he and Jimmy had gone down to Florida to straighten out a drug deal gone bad. 
Tommy had remained behind in New York because he was going to be made. When Jimmy called to see if the ceremony had occurred. The code phrase was to ask if Tommy had seen his godmother yet, Jimmy was told that it had been called off due to a heavy snowfall. The next day, Jimmy got a phone call and found out that Tommy had been murdered, he slammed the phone down and began crying, as depicted in the film Goodfellas. Thomas Agro claimed in 1985 that he was the driving force behind Tommy's murder. Agro also claimed to have murdered D. Simone's brother Anthony after he turned informant. He also suggested murdering the eldest and last remaining brother, Robert. According to Ionuzzi, Agro would often laughingly refer to killing the third D. Simone brother, stating that maybe it's time to go for the D. Simone trifecta. Another account, told by Henry Hill and Gangsters and Goodfellas, states that John Gotti himself was the most likely assassin. Hill would reaffirm years later that John Gotti had killed Tommy D. Simone. He also added that the death took a long time because Billy Batts had been a personal friend of John's and he wanted to assure that Tommy suffered before he died. Henry Henry Hill and Paul Mazzi would continue to expand their operations by setting up a point-shaving scheme, which was put in place when Mazzi convinced Boston College center Rick Kuhn to participate. Kuhn encouraged teammates to join the scheme, which became a scandal. Hill also claimed to have an NBA referee who worked games at Madison Square Garden during the 70s in his pocket because of the debt the referee had incurred gambling on horse races. On April 27, 1980, Hill was arrested on a narcotics trafficking charge. He bonded out of jail and shortly afterwards was rearrested as a material witness in the LaFonza heist robbery. He became convinced that his former associates planned to have him killed. Polly, for dealing drugs, and Jimmy, to prevent Hill from implicating him in the LaFonza robbery. This was confirmed by a surveillance tape played to Henry Hill by federal investigators in which Jimmy tells Polly of their need to have Hill whacked. In reference to his many victims, Hill, who claims that he has never killed anyone, stated in an interview in March 2008 that he don't give a heck what those people think, I'm doing the right thing now. On May 27, 1980, one month after his narcotics trafficking arrest, Hill chose to become an informant, signing with the U.S. Department of Justice Witness Protection Program to avoid possible execution by the mafia or going to prison for his crimes. His testimony led to almost 50 convictions. According to Hill, a search warrant for Robert's lounge was granted by a judge. But by the time the police arrived, Jimmy had already relocated the bodies he'd had buried there, such as those of Dominic Remo Sersani and Spider, a Robert's lounge bartender, who was shot to death by Tommy, as mentioned earlier. Partially as a result of the testimony of Henry and Werner, Jimmy Burke was taken into custody on April 1, 1980, on suspicion of a number of crimes. In 1982, he was convicted of fixing Boston College basketball games as part of a point-shaving gambling scam in 1978, he was sentenced to 20 years. Jimmy protested that he gave the little bastard, meaning Henry Hill, some bucks to bet on games, and that's it. Authorities knew he had planned and organized the LaFonza heist. However, they did not have enough evidence to prove it in a court of law. Although Burke was suspected of committing more than 20 murders, he was only convicted of one, the murder of Richard Eaton, a hustler and confidence man. If he had disposed of Eaton the same way he disposed of most of his victims, Burke could have been a free man before he died. Instead, he beat and strangled Eaton to death, then dumped the body on the floor of an abandoned garbage lot in Brooklyn. It was winter at the time, and his frozen body wasn't discovered until days later by children playing there. Detectives found a small address book on him with Jimmy Burke's name in it. Burke was later charged with the murder of Eaton, based on evidence Henry Hill gave to authorities. At the trial, Hill took the stand and testified against his former friend. Hill testified Eaton had convinced Burke to invest $250,000 in a cocaine deal that promised immense profit. However, Eaton kept the money for his own use. At one point, when Henry asked Jimmy about Eaton's whereabouts, observing that he hadn't been around in a while, Jimmy replied don't worry about him. I whacked the swindler out. Burke also told Hill that this would be a lesson to anyone who had not paid him his money. Based on the evidence of Burke's name address and phone number found in Eaton's coat lining, when his body was found, along with Henry Hill's testimony, Jimmy Burke was convicted, and on February 19, 1985, he was given a life sentence. When he was leaving New York on an airplane, he looked down at JFK Airport and said to an officer, once upon a time, that was all mine. Burke was serving his time in Wen Correctional Facility in Alden, New York. He developed lung cancer and he died from this disease on April 13, 1996, at age 64, while being treated at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. Jimmy's sons, Frank James Burke was found by police shot to death on May 18, 1987, at 1043 Liberty Avenue in the Cypress Hills section of Brooklyn, at 2.30 in the morning, he was 27 years old.
His other son, Jesse James Burke, is not involved in organized crime and lives a normal life. Polly died while incarcerated on November 22, 1988, at the age of 73, while serving a 10- to 12-year sentence for convictions largely gained through the testimony of Henry Hill, who entered the Federal Witness Protection Program after testifying, but was expelled several years later for revealing his identity in preparation for his autobiography. Paul Verio's body is buried at St. John Cemetery in Queens, New York.